Hey guys, I'm Slave to the Games, and this is the next clan video for Wild the Bloodlines 2 full in depth explanation series. Thank you guys for stopping by, and I hope you enjoy it. This is, uh, well, soon to be the last videos that you actually hear this mic quality. I got myself an XLR mic as well as a mixer for it, so hopefully, with that and some testing, changing settings and everything i'll be able to well give you guys a better sounding well video overall when it comes to my own voice thank you guys for stopping by i hope you enjoy it this time we're going to be going over the gangrel all okay. the gangrel are one of the 13 vampire clans found in the world of darkness nomads who hold closer ties to the wild places than most of their city-bound cousins they are closer to the animal aspect of the beast and are masters of the protean discipline they were one of the seven founding clans of the Camarilla, but became disillusioned with the sect in the final nights, its elders eventually deciding to sever its ties and become an independent clan. Due to their inherent clan weakness, Gangrel are very close to the beast within. As they succumb to it, it leaves its mark on their bodies permanently. There are many different approaches to the history of the Gangrel. The disparate nature of the Outlanders and their mostly oral, recorded histories make an exact depiction of their early history difficult, but it seems certain that the Gangrel were always wanderers, who followed nomadic tribes around, sleeping in the earth to escape the sun. Although some Gangrel tell the myth of Cain and how Enoya was cast out due to a betrayal of the Ravnos Antediluvian and forced to live with the beasts, there are many other tales. The Gangrel of Scandinavia tell tales of the Inherhar and Karl, who was cursed by Odin, while another popular myth was that Enoya and her twin brother Cherka were demigods that warred against each other, Enoya with the most brave warriors and Cherka with the most cunning at night, so that the other gods would not learn of their feud. After Enoya, however, was betrayed by two of her lieutenants who left her, she and her army were driven to the east, where Enoya left them on their own. By battling Cherka's Get and the demonic giants that served him, they would do penance for the betrayal of their chieftains. After a long series of battle, the Gangrel were driven to the west, in the civilizations of other kindred. Other stories tell that Enoya was the mother of gypsies, and both the werewolves and the Gangrel descend from them. Most among the clan, however, do not know or care any longer about creation myths of their kind, instead focusing to survive in the present. The mystery still remains. The Gangrel shunned many of the civilizations of antiquity, instead roaming the woods and preying on tribal societies who regarded them as evil spirits that were meant to appease. They had almost nothing to do with the development of the Roman Empire, though occasionally a Britannic, Gullian, or Gothic gangrel would nose around Rome in the hopes of catching a young Neone off guard. If there were any gangrel in the city itself, they were likely attached to any of the slave races, mainland Europeans, Africans, Middle Easterns, or even exotic peoples. Gangle fought on both sides of the Punic Wars, although in the end, most flocked to the Ventry. In Scandinavia, the Methuselah, known as Odin, the All High, held the Northmen in a tight grip and ruled as a corporeal god, sending them down to raid the civilizations he despised in order for his warriors to earn the right of the embrace. The Northwestern Gangrel during the Dark Ages, regarded as members of the Low Clans by their high-blooded peers, were experimenting with expansionism and traveled to the Four Winds to far-off lands to conquer, explore, and trade. As paganism was on the decline and many gangrel could not pose as normal humans due to their growing abnormality, they instead prowled the countryside, feeding for peasants and travelers. During these days, the gangrel allied themselves with the Tismazi against the nascent Tremere in the Omen War. The Islamic gangrel of the period were called Washin and were essentially straightforward nomads, masters of the desert and wastelands of Arabia and North Africa. A few of the Washin felt differently and eventually split from the main part of the clan, calling themselves the Tafi Gangrel. These were generally more scholarly and adept with civilization than the rest of the Bayou. The Renaissance and the loss of woodland made unlife complicated for the Gangrel. The masquerade and the heavy decline of pagan religions made hunting difficult for them without drawing notice, and the growing anger of the Lupines against human encroachment found more often than not a vental within a lone Gangrel. Many Gangrel left the Camarilla during this time, instead traveling as Articus, leaving Europe completely in search for untouched wilderness, or receded into those few tribal societies still existing. In the rapid growth of cities and technology that marked the Victorian age, very few Gangrel had any interest in staying in towns and hamlets that became industrial centers almost overnight. Additionally though, there were few documented cases of mortals possessing true faith. The growth of religious influence made many Gangrel cringe, where of another round of the vicious inquisitorial practices of the Dark Ages. 
Only the scholar and theology, debater, Beckett was known to have any regular dealings with proper kindred society during this period. Most other clan members hiked into the wilderness to wait out this newest burst of human ingenuity and religious fervor. Some claim that the city gangrel began to evolve during this stage due to urbanization and the desolate situation in most fabrics. Following the Sabbath invasion of the East Coast, the Camarilla suffered another blow with the departure of the Gangrel. The reasons for their withdrawal are unknown. It is rumored then Justicar Xavier went before the inner circle, uttered a single sentence, and left. Word spread throughout the clan, and over the course of a month, the majority of the clan abandoned the sect and became independent. Status in general among the Gangrel is decided by rights, and these rights involve one of two things, combat or boasting. Combat is usually basic and unarmed. Two gangrel who know each other well may simply spar, but those who are strangers battle until one of the fighters is incapacitated or surrenders. Boasting involves the two gangrel making large claims until one gangrel backs down or asks for proof. The challenged gangrel must then show proof of their claims or lose the right and their status. What little formal organization the gangrel has is placed around the aptly named Gather, which are occasional meetings at which local and visiting gangrel can exchange news, information, and stories and decide on local matters. Gatherings usually involve notice weeks in advance as news travels more slowly among the limited network of the gangrel. Once begun, gathers usually involve the rights demonstrating status to decide on leadership for the meeting. The rights can take days to accomplish and must be redone for every gather, as no two will have the same gangrel meeting under the same circumstances. Once the hierarchy for the gather is established, the business at hand can be dealt with. No matter the circumstances, gathers always break up after a week. Gathers can also be used to form rebels, which are essentially calls to battle. The gangrel who participate in a rebel form parties to track down and destroy enemies, such as enemy kindred, Garu, or others who have dared to invade the clan's territory. There are also meetings called Great Gathers. As a Great Gather relies on a powerful gangrel who is respected by most of the clan to be called, they are extremely rare. When one is called, any member of the clan who can must travel to the meeting place. There are similar rights of strength and status that are found in a regular gather, take place. However, there are no time limits to either the rites or the Great Gather. Even more rare but related are Grand Rebels, which are essentially wars and battles involving the entire clan. Both are considered to be signs of bad luck by most Gangrel, and the fact that neither have been called in centuries is seen as a good sign. Two main variants exist among the Sabbath, the Country Gangrel and the City Gangrel. The country gangrel are largely similar to the main clan, with the fortitude, animalism, and protein disciplines. The city gangrel have adapted to city life, forgoing animalism and fortitude for celerity and obfuscate. Both are collectively referred to as gangrel and teacher view. Given the mutually inherent in gangrel vidae, the clan is particularly prone to numerous offshoots, variants, and bloodlines. So much so that it is hard to know where to draw the line between what constitutes a proper gangrel and what does not. Individual opinion among clan members differ naturally. The Greek gangrel were an offshoot which began in the Dark Ages. They are the historical antecedents of the modern city gangrel. Gangrel have been hiding in the cities of man even before Babylon. As the centuries have passed, these gangrel have focused on surviving a different environment, one fraught with its own unique dangers. The Greek gangrel, as they call themselves, developed obfuscate into their fortitude, finding it better to hide from danger where mortals congregate. The Greek gangrel are also on good terms with the Nosferatu who shared the sewers with them. There are very few Greek gangrel and most of them appeared in Constantinople, with at least one present in Paris during the Dark Ages. Unlike their wild brethren, they rarely ventured out into the wilderness. Though they never met at gangrel gathers, many expressed interest in building ties with the main clan. The city gangrel are a bloodline in the gangrel that has adapted to urban environments, as I have said. In the Dark Ages, the bloodline was known as the Greek gangrel, as they were thought to have originated in Greece. In the modern nights, the city gangrel form half of the gangrel and teach view within the Sabbath. The city gangrel reminds some kindred of coyotes. They are creatures well suited for wilderness life, but they adapt to an urban existence quite smoothly. The high properness of prey in the cities, coupled with the gangrel's inherent mutuality of blood, has allowed the line to flourish. Their association with the Sabbath means that they embrace prolifically but also that their unlife expectancy is short. Unlike country gangrel who can afford to let their animalistic ways take over and their appearances grow truly bestial, the coyotes must either adopt a more Nosferatu-like approach to unlife or blend in with their prey. To outward appearance then, these latter kindred seem human, dressed as appropriate to their area and the social class they mimic. But city gangrel are still savage vampires, and that means they are predators. Any disguise they adopt is strictly that. 
camouflage to allow them to get close enough to bite. The country gangrel resembled independent and Camarilla gangrel. They're savage, vicious hunters more comfortable in the wilds between cities than the concrete jungles. The sap has seen an influx of gangrel converts from the Camarilla and these hunters easily lost themselves in stalking and killing. The country gangrel served the Sabbat as assassins and scouts, using their command of animals to gather intelligence on the comings and goings of other kindred. They are called hunters. Travel between cities was never exactly safe as lupines seemed to prowl any patch of land large enough to grow a few trees, or so Camarilla elders have always told their childer. But with the hunters prowling about looking for wayward neonates, iterant kindred faced even more dire threats. This may sound like Camarilla propaganda, but the country gangrel will do all they can to make it true. Free from the constraints of having to look human, these creatures relish the chance to hunt as wolves, hunt savagely and in packs. If they have a regret, it is that their prey cannot usually run fast enough to make the hunt last. Gangrel mariners, called Gangrel Aquari, or Gangrel Aquaria Singular among Tremere scholars, Though the mariners themselves reject this name, are a minuscule offshoot of the main gangrel clan who make their homes underwater. With the exception of their clan weakness, all apparent features of the bloodline appear to be acquired rather than inborn. This bloodline is not necessarily transferred from sire to childe. The childe of any gangrel may become a mariner, and the childe of any mariner may not necessarily end up as a mariner's themselves. A gangrel's status as a mariner is determined based upon his affinity to the sea and whether or not that gangrel chooses to live the majority of his unlife underwater. Despite the vast reaches of the ocean, the mariners count only about 30 among their number. Their numbers may be underestimated, as mariners tend to consider themselves individuals rather than by a distinct bloodline, and many older mariners are often so changed by animalistic adaptations that many, including other gangrel, mistake them for monsters rather than other vampires. The mariners do not have any formal organization as, just like their parent clan, they are largely individualistic. The only known group of mariners live in Lake Nyasa in southeastern Africa and consist of at least four members. Due to their ruthless efficiency in guarding the lake and its environs, it has been impossible to determine what, if anything, this brood protects. Otherwise, if two mariners ever meet, they will generally determine authority based on age and generation. Mariners also tend to follow two different groups, sedentary and nomadic. The sedentary mariners will claim a territory, either a specific lake or river, or several miles of coastline. These mariners are extremely territorial and will defend their territory from any intrusions. Nomadic mariners, on the other hand, have no territory and will travel wherever the tides carry them. While mariners employ protean, they use a particular version of it. In this version, they gain sonar instead of night vision, and razor sharp webbed hands and feet instead of claws. Other than that, the only thing that can be considered different about their form of protean is the animals they turn into with the shape of the beast, which are always aquatic, though they occasionally will take the forms of seafaring birds such as an albatross or seagull for their flight form. It does not as a novel discipline, it does not count as a novel discipline, but rather alternate abilities with the same discipline. Curiously, although protein can be learned by any vampire, the mariner variants can only be learned by other gangrel. While the Ashira call all gangrel Washin, there exists a distinctive line between both parts, similar to the division between city and country gangrel, although with a much more hostile relation. In general, all Washin are believed to have been descended from a single vampire, the fifth generation Methasula Zayat, one of Suleiman's and Turek's early allies. Though how much this general application holds worth for a clan of natural wanderers is debatable. The first group were the Washin, that saw themselves as heirs and protectors to the nomadic Bedouins tribes of North Africa and Arabia. Many Washin, even though they followed the teachings of Islam to a point, were also wary of its influence what the encroaching civilization meant to them. The second group were the Taifa, centered around Iberia who openly converted to Islam after the exemplar of the gangrel Methasula Shabako, and began to dwell in cities and develop social connections. The gangrel are considered the most feral and predatory of the kindred, and because of their recluse natures, animalistic tendencies, and loose organization are the least social of the canines, preferring solitude to society. They also tend to be extremely territorial and possessive, and to enter a gangrel's territory without permission is certain death. They do have their role and reputation among the kindred as fierce warriors, but to get a gangrel to agree to work with others, even other gangrel, can be difficult if not impossible. 
Most of the clan's legends and myths, as well as the ways to garner prestige within the clan, are done orally. Storytelling and being able to hold a crowd are considered fairly valuable social currency, as there is little else to do in gatherings out in the wilderness besides entertain each other with bravado and song. Most of these stories are true, but a good, satisfying tale is regarded as more important than the facts of the details. Gangrels do not lie precisely, but embellishing the truth is a good way to sound much more impressive, in the same way a cat puffs up its fur to look more threatening. Keeping to one's spoken word is also highly respected, as when all is said and done, the only thing stopping another vampire from screwing you over is their own sense of honor. This is not to say that more socially inclined Gangrel cannot learn to play Jihad, in fact many enjoy, or at least grudgingly accept, the great masquerade ball of betrayal, conspiracy, and power struggles that define so much of kindred existence. The Gangrel also have ties to the Roma, and therefore will protect and shelter them, especially from other kindred. The Ravnos would also lay claim to the Roma, however, and as a result the two clans have a mutual hatred for each other that goes back centuries. Given the distinctly rural nature of Clan Gangrel, the observer may be surprised to learn that many higher generation Gangrel are adept at managing modern technology such as cell phones, computers, and cutting edge vehicles. Clan Gangrel has realized that knowledge of technology is an important aspect of survival in the modern nights, and even the eldest Gangrel know how to work a microwave. The importance of oral history and tradition, including the tales of their antediluvian, puts the Gangrel at odds with the Camarilla party line that such things do not exist, especially since the Book of Nod was made available through Aisha Jokashian. Tricking Beckett, the Camarilla quietly persecuted Gangrel lore masters, blaming the deaths on the rising Sabbath activity. Since then, the Gangrel had become more withdrawn, only sharing their stories at clan in turn Alvings. A Gangrel sire often chooses a prospective candidate for the embrace during feeding. If the mortal prey resists fighting against what is happening, then his reward after death may be a taste of Gangrel blood. The clan makes Gangrel this way, dating back to the first warrior selected by Anuia to fight her war. This method produces a Gangrel with a fierce desire to survive, even if he does not have all the tools. We also find prospective Gangrel through observation. While most mortals remain safely hidden during the night, a few risk the darkness. When one of our clans encounters a mortal like this, they will watch instead of attacking. It takes courage to wander these nights after all. The eagle observes the mortal, watching for any signs of bravery or a knack for survival. Sometimes a mortal out at night is simply lost. If this proves to be the case, he becomes prey. However, if the mortal shows skills moving about at night, is no coward and maintains the interests of the observer, he is a good candidate for the embrace. When we punish, however, there is little effort wasted. A mortal who insults or threatens one of our clan receives a nighttime visit. The Gangrel embraces the mortal, making the process as painful and terror-filled as possible, and leaves her. Usually the embrace happens indoors, in the rooms of the person punished, assuring their discovery and destruction. In recent nights this punishment has fallen into disuse, though there are still some who actively enact it. A choice is almost never offered. This has become a tradition with the clan, since so few of them had a choice. The offspring of their gangrel are considered by some to be inferior stock even if they do survive. While not considered outcasts, a gangrel given a choice rarely receives the same respect of those embraced traditionally, even after the rites of status. Embracing foes has the potential to backfire on the gangrel. Should an enemy survive the first nights and develop his power, he could turn his new abilities to hunting the one who cursed him. This is a rare occurrence. Part of the punishment is to stack the odds so that the survival is nearly impossible. A new Gangrel who manages to survive has an enviable combination of cunning, raw ability, and luck. Clearly a dangerous foe to have in pursuit, but possibly one with a bright future in the clan. After the embrace, the sire disappears into the night, leaving the new Gangrel on his own. The Gangrel believe that it is better to save the effort of training a child day until after he has proven that he can survive. Thus the sire completely abandons his new creation in the early nights, leaving him alone to face the struggles of survival. Many do not last beyond even the first night. That first hunger is the strongest and it brings the beast quickly to the surface. In the hair of that first wild rage, a child that makes an any number of mistakes. If lupines and morals do not destroy him, the first sunrise may. If the sire has chosen well, however, the child that quickly grasps his situation and adjusts. The reward for that first night is one of the annoyous marks. Any Gangrel resilient and capable enough to survive the first few nights soon develops the tools that Gangrel use to survive those that follow. Over time, the child they must learn to grow claws, speak with the animals, and come to terms with our strengths and weaknesses. He must also learn to make decisions on his own rapidly. The Vipir condition does not permit long reflection on the proper course to take. Such indecision leads to the final death. This is a dangerous time for the child aid, lost and without guidance. 
A new Gangrel must survive at least one winter before he is worthy of teaching. How many winters is often the first question a Gangrel asks upon first meeting another in the wilderness. A new Gangrel rarely has the correct answer and thus reveals himself. Tradition has it that any pup so encountered becomes a responsibility. The older Gangrel must aid him in his survival and teach him the ways of the clan, at least until his nature is revealed. If the pup ends up being from the canine broods, the Gangrel leaves him to his fate. Once accepted, the new Gangrel learns the stories and traditions of the clan, particularly the greetings ritual and the rites of status. Instruction in the use of the Gangrel gifts follows. The lessons include depictions of their relationships with the Ravnos, Lupines, and Canines. After months of this teaching, a close bond forms between the student and teacher, similar to the relationship between a sire and child day among the Canines. After this training, a Gangrel is officially a member of the clan. Jesus Christ, guys, after reading everything, I am so out of breath. I'm hoping that you're enjoying this. I hope you enjoyed this video itself. If you did, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe, and maybe, just maybe, think about joining the Discord below with the link, and then also maybe optionally joining the Patreon as a Patreon member. Although, of course, joining the Discord or the Patreon is completely optional, but I would nevertheless 100% support whatever decision you guys choose, and I'm glad that you guys are still sticking with me. I know it's been a little bit since I released last one. I think it's been like a week now. A little over a week, actually. I wanted to actually wait a little bit because I was working like back to back to back to back things. I need a little bit of time. I also had some issues with the internet and then I also am getting new parts. Uh, I'm getting a new monitor, a new mic. I'm getting like a lot of new things are coming in and going out and having issues left and right and then fixing them, etc. Just a lot has been going on and I'm glad to finally release this so that you guys do know I'm still doing it. I was going to release a Cyberpunk 2077 video, but it's just... There's not a lot of information right now, and I don't want to release something that's half-baked. So, once again, as I've said in all the other videos, this was taken from the White Wolf Wikipedia fandom. Just like all the other clan videos, and I really hope you enjoyed it. Shout out to the fandom page. The link's gonna be below, just like normal. And once again, thank you guys for stopping by, and I will catch you in my next release. I'll see you guys later.